Well, thank you and welcome everyone. And uh, Tishuk, thank you for a wonderful speech. And you chose quite the day to come to Washington. Everyone's a buzz with, um, the, with the drama, but we'll avoid never, that. Ne ne never a boring day in Washington. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> certainly true of the last 18 months, for sure. Um, so let's, uh, let, let's start maybe with, there's a lot, a lot there, and I hope to get to most of it. And we'll go to all of you for, for questions as well in about 15, 20 minutes. But um, let's start with trade. Um, it's really the issue of the day, as you said, until this morning. Um, but last week, President Trump imposed tariffs uh, on, on steel, uh, including on the EU. He's threatened a lot worse on Twitter and other forms. But as part of a sort of a larger uh, pattern whereby in his administration, there's sort of a distrust of the EU. You know, they see the EU as this post-sovereign organization that sort of threatens nation states. Uh, Trump has been pretty close to Nigel Farage and, and to others. And so when you meet him on, on Thursday, and to Americans generally who may have a skepticism of the EU, how would you sort of explain uh, the EU to them, sort of the importance of a strong relationship between the United States and the European Union, uh, including on trade? Yeah, I, I suppose, um, I suppose per perhaps, perhaps the, the best way to try to explain it is, is maybe to explain um, you know the origins of the EU and how it came about. It's easy. It's easy to forget this, but um, the European Union was born out of the Second World War. Uh, was born out of the defeat of Nazism, which only occurred, of course, because 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 America chose to take part in that war. Uh, and a decision was made that the best way to avoid future wars in Europe uh, was uh, through uh, economic cooperation uh, between France and Germany, integrating their economies so much uh, that they would never go to war again. Uh, so ultimately, it was a project uh, that was all about democracy and economic development uh, and uh, f fighting extremism and tyranny. And then the European Union did it all over again uh, when communism failed uh, in, at the end of the 80s and the early 90s. Uh, how do we make sure that those countries of Central and Eastern Europe followed a, a democratic path, followed a market economy path, followed a capitalist path? And that was the prospect of European Union membership. Um, so uh, it's a project to me, the European project, which is all about um, all about free enterprise, all about trade, all about economic development. Um, and I suppose rather than being post-sovereign is about, is about sharing sovereignty, which maybe can be difficult to understand in American context, as America is so big, but perhaps America is a bit like that itself, uh, given that states share sovereignty through a federal system as well. And on the trade piece, I mean, we seem like we're on the we're on the cusp of sort of an escalation, whereby there's, you know, a European response to the tariffs at, as a deterrent. Uh, Trump has said he may respond with additional tariffs. How worried are you that this could sort of spiral out of control and we could have a full-blown trade war? Do you think it's possible to sort of advert that, stand down, and sort of re-engage in the, in the trade negotiations, the TTIP negotiations, or some other version of it? Yeah, well, as you say, it's, um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be an interesting week because we expect that the Com European Commission tomorrow will give its response to um, uh, the White House's, uh, the White House's um, uh, threats of tariffs. So uh, that may actually form part of the context um, for the meeting that I'll have with President Trump, Trump on, on Thursday. Um, much as I'd love to see re-engagement around TTIP, I think that's probably a little bit, a little bit too ambitious, um, given other things that, that are going on. Um, but I would hope that uh, both sides would pull back from uh, any sort of trade war. I, I can only see, I can only see everyone losing out from this. You know, if you look at Ireland, we don't really have a steel, we don't have a steel industry at all, and we have very little aluminum. So, the initial round of tariffs isn't going to affect us, but. The European Union's response seems to be around, you know, things like Harley Davidsons and whiskey, uh, whiskey and, mm. and denim. And of course, it occurred to me that um, that that if 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 the, if the European Union, or if the, if the European Union slaps tariffs on on bourbon whiskey, the next response might be um, maybe Irish and Scottish whiskey. And that's where that's the kind of spiral that you go down with trade wars. And I find it really hard to see how economies could benefit in the round. You might have some sectoral interests in certain places that aren't doing well because they're not competitive, uh, doing well as a result of, of trade restrictions, but not, uh, not economies in the round uh, and not the most competitive industries. Um, uh, but I'm also not naive as well to the fact that there are protectionist instincts in the European Union too. Um, and we see, we see that dressed up in lots of different ways. Uh, but there are you know, some forces in the European Union in Europe uh, 
who are jealous of the success of America, um, of the fact that some American companies uh, do so well, uh, and you know would relish the prospect of imposing restrictions on investment or tariffs on American companies uh, in the false belief that that would then allow European companies to fill the gap, which is, you know, the the the, the, doc, the nonsensical doc, doctrine of, of protectionism, which al already existed. So. Um, if we have a chance to talk about it anyway on Thursday, I, you know, I, I'll certainly be making my point in in, in that vein uh, that this isn't this isn't this isn't a policy that anyone's going to gain from. And and just you, you touch on these forces also in the EU. I mean, you're you're someone who was elected recently with quite a, a elected teacher recently with a, a sort of a, quite an internationalist outlook and. President Macron, you know, similar outlook, but in many parts of the world, leaders are being elected who are sort of promising their people, you know, that they're going to stop having foreigners take advantage of them, they're going to cut foreign aid, they're going to focus on sort of the narrow sort of nationalism. As you look at Europe, but also the wider world where there's this sort of populist um, uh, movement, really, uh, 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 as we saw recently in Italy. How do you sort of diagnose that, and, and do you feel that, you know, as Tony Blair said a year ago, you know, maybe the internationalism, you know, of the 90s is actually on its way out, and we're actually headed into a more nationalistic world? I mean, how do you sort of conceive of it from where you uh, sit? Yeah, well, I, I, I think there's, there's two things. I think, I think the most important thing is to, uh, is to push back. Um, you know, the, the reason why, why people get involved in politics is because they believe in things and want to change things or want to protect things. And I don't think you can have an analysis that just says that, you know, this is the trend of world politics and we're, you know, we're moving away from globalism towards, um, you know, towards a, um, a, a new form of nationalism. And sure, sooner or later, it'll all come full cycle again. We'll move back towards... Um, uh, uh, internationalism again, because I think that's that's a very passive approach. It's actually up to us, people who are involved in politics, uh, to make the argument uh, for for internationalism, to make the argument for free trade, for free enterprise, to make the argument for multilateralism. Uh, and in fairness to, to to Macron, even though he wouldn't agree on everything, uh, that's very much what he did. Um, and different politicians have adopted different approaches in Europe. Uh, some have tried to steal the clothes of populist populists and steal the nationalist rhetoric of populists in order to stunt their growth, and some of them have been successful in doing that. Uh, others have decided to tackle it head on and stand up to it. And I think that's something he's done uh, in France, and that's a better example to follow, I think, uh, than other countries have. But I also think we need to look at the, the environment. Um, ultimately, stagnant or falling living standards is a breeding ground for nationalism and populism. And uh, I think a lot of what's happened uh, in, in Italy, for example, um, is as much about a stagnant economy, high youth unemployment, um, living standards not rising for a very long time now, as it is about concerns about migration. And those concerns about migration are real. Um, but it's, it's in the absence of improving living standards that you create a breeding ground for nationalism and populism. And that's why it's really important that governments make sure that uh, we have strong, robust economies and that all people and all parts of countries feel the benefits of that. Um, moving on to uh, on to Brexit, which of course is a major part of your speech, and I think is on everyone's mind here today. Um, you know, the the question of of the Irish border, of course, has emerged as the preeminent question in the negotiations, and there are three sort of solutions to that, all of which have been ruled out by people who effectively yield a veto. Um, one option is a hard border, and you and the Irish government have ruled that out, supported by the the EU 27, the other 26 members of the EU negotiating with the, with the UK. Uh, the second option is Britain staying in the customs union and the Conservative Party has seemed to have vetoed that. You know, the, the Prime Minister's had to say she's not going to pursue that course. And the third option is some sort of special status for Northern Ireland, which the DUP have ruled out. So uh, I guess one question is where, where is this headed, but also you know, if everyone sticks to their guns on this um, and there is no deal, what does that mean for Ireland? What does no deal mean? And is there any way to avoid that without somebody having to capitulate? Yeah, well, I, I, I think things are still developing. Um, and we've seen a number of 
a number of changes in, in the British position over the past uh, couple of months. Um, and it's um, certainly possible that we'll see further changes uh, in, in the coming months. I think in many ways the Irish border has become the central question in Brexit precisely because it does crystallise those bigger issues. Uh, you know, what relationship does the United Kingdom really want to have with the European Union uh, when it leaves? Uh, and I'm not sure they fully know yet. Uh, and what we've done in the withdrawal agreement uh, is turn into a legal text what was agreed as a political agreement mm -hmm. back in December. And, and bear in mind, the, the UK government has also ruled out a hard border, so nobody's actually seeking a hard border. Um, if it does happen, it'll be um, a major political accident if that's, if that's where, we, where we end up in a few years' time, because it is... But your, your position, though, to just to it. clarify, is that if, even if they don't want to impose it, that if, they, if there is this regulatory hmm. divergence, that it will happen sort of by force of nature, that it, because of WTO rules or other rules, that, that in order to avoid it, that they, there has to be regulatory alignment between Ireland, North and South. Uh, is that right? Y yeah, th it does, doesn't mean that Northern Ireland has to stay in, in the customs union or single market, but it does mean uh, that we would form a common regulatory area. In the same way there's a common travel area between Britain and Ireland, uh, Northern Ireland would form a common regulatory area um, uh, with the European Union, um, thereby adopting the rules of the customs union in some aspects of the single market. But that is, that is what we call the backstop. It's what Prime Minister May calls uh, the last resort. Um, the best solution, which is one that we want, um, and I think the Unionist Party wants as well, and I think that uh, perhaps a lot of people in, in, in Britain want too, uh, is to render that issue around the Irish uh, border um, irrelevant because the new relationship between the UK and the EU would be so strong uh, that it wouldn't arise as a question. Uh, but that does, that does involve a change mm -hmm. in policy and a change in position. Um, by London, by, by the British government, uh, and um, that is not yet forthcoming. But, um, uh, you know, we shouldn't forget that the people in the UK voted by a very small margin to leave the European Union. Um, when I remember that referendum happening, you know, the debates were barely at all about the customs union. I don't think it even came up. Um, and not all that much about the single market either, certainly the, the freedom of movement aspects of it. Um, but what we have now in the UK is after a very narrow vote uh, to leave the European Union, two of the countries, Northern Ireland and Scotland, voting not to leave, uh, that's been interpreted as a very hard Brexit. Uh, and I think that position is going to become a difficult one to square. Um, uh, the United States has had, of course, a, a significant a sort of a significant cameo role in the peace process in, in the past. It wasn't the lead player, but it was a an important player and, and uh, there's been US support for the peace process all along. We're, of course, on the 20th anniversary now. Do you see any role for the US in general, not necessarily for the administration, but for, you know, on Capitol Hill or, or, or for private envoys or others in, in trying to address this question, which I think is, you know, of, of serious interest here because there's a there's a U.S. interest in upholding the peace process. Is there anything the United States can do to sort of help move this along? Yeah, well, well I, I think at the outset it's, it's important to acknowledge that, that the role the United States played in the peace process and the Good Friday Agreement was, uh, was a lot more than a cameo role. Uh, you know, George Mitchell chaired, chaired the talks uh, 20 years ago, um, and President Clinton and others took an enormous personal interest right, uh, right, right, in, right, right. In, in, in affairs. And where the, where the U.S. has influence, um, you know, it does have influence, first of all, on, on, on the parties in Northern Ireland, uh, not least on, you know, on, on Sinn Féin, the biggest party uh, on the national side, um, has very strong and deep connections in the United States, and um, there is American pressure that can be put, uh, put, put on them to go down, go, da go down the road of compromise, which was done in the past, uh, and also has influence on the British government as well. Um, and, you know, and that's, that, that, that's a role, role that the U.S., uh, that the U.S. can play, I think, is particularly valuable. Um, you know, when it comes to to U.S. members of Congress and um, members of the administration who take an interest in Irish affairs, who you know put it on yeah. on a level that mightn't otherwise be on, uh, and that that that's always helpful. So, do you think they should play that role in the coming months, given that it's at such a delicate balance? Or, I, I think I think ongoing interest and, and engagement from the administration and from members of Congress uh, and from Irish America would be very welcome. Uh, 
I'm, I'm not sure if the appointment of an envoy or something like that is necessarily what would be required at this stage. Uh, you know, the two parties came very close uh, to an accommodation um, anyway. Uh, so I, I, don't think, I don't think brokerage is what we need, uh, but I do think ongoing interest and engagement from the United States uh, remains, remains very important. And certainly from my point of view as, as leader of the Irish government, remain, remains very welcome. Yeah. Uh, one thing you mentioned in your in your speech, you, you mentioned a role for you know that Ireland's role, Ireland's relationship with the United States may evolve a bit after Brexit. You know that the U.S. had sort of not quite worked through Britain, but Britain was was the country that understood the U.S. well, and there was lots of internal debates in the EU, and sometimes British interests aligned a little bit more with America's interests than maybe some other countries did. I, I was wondering if you could expand on that a little bit. I mean, what sort of additional elements to the relationship do you think might sort of, uh, you know, uh, be come to fruition or, or be developed in the coming years once, if Britain does leave the EU, what, what's that sort of US-Ireland relationship look like in that context? Yeah, I think I think there's there's two aspects of that. You know, the, the European Union without the United Kingdom is going to be a very different place. Uh, I think it's going to be uh, less of a place uh, because of their absence. Um, you know, uh, they've been very much uh, a like-minded country to Ireland when it's come to the Atlantic relationship, when it's come to um, uh, trade, when it's come to free enterprise, uh, so many different things. And having them uh, gone is going to be a, a big loss. So. Um, it has two, two downstream effects, though, that I think are relevant to Ireland. Uh, the first is that Ireland has to form new alliances, uh, our natural ally on most questions, not agriculture, but pretty much everything else, uh, will be gone. Uh, so we're already very much in the process of forming uh, new alliances, with, particularly but not exclusively with other small countries uh, that have a similar outlook when it comes to free enterprise and free trade. A lot of the Nordic countries, Baltic countries, some of the countries in Central Eastern Europe um, and that's us building new alliances, if you like, within 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 the European Union. Uh, and the second is the um, uh, is 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 our relationship with America. And I mentioned that in the speech, uh, where I think that Ireland uh, can become uh, a bridge between uh, America and the EU, particularly with Britain not there anymore, uh, that we can play a role uh, in interpreting the American position better to the EU and the EU's position better to America. And that's because of our. Our long-standing friendship is because we share the same language, it's because of um, the economic ties we have, it's because of a very similar uh, political and business culture in many ways. Uh, that is not to suggest for, for a second that we were offering ourselves up as America's agents <laughs> in the European Union because um, that's not what I mean. Uh, you know, we're, we're committed members of the EU, we're, we're going to be at the heart of the EU. Uh, we believe in further European integration. Uh, but I think sometimes the two sides can misunderstand each other. Yeah. Uh, we often talk that we often talk about Europe and America, or, or even the UK and Ireland and America being being divided by this, by a common language. Um, we're going to the European Union now, in which we're the only ones who speak speak that language. Uh, and I think there's a role for us to play there. Yeah, I, I was struck last week. I think it was that your, your Minister of Finance uh, agreed this document with the Nordic countries mm. on. on the future of the Eurozone was sort of interesting. Ireland's often put into the periphery of Europe and it's with Estonia and others. But I'd like to say one final question related to that and then we'll go to the audience. And it's sort of how you finished the speech talking about the role of small countries. And, uh, you know, at a time when the world is becoming more geopolitically competitive, we have these, you know, weird assassinations that you mentioned at the beginning, you know, island building in the South China Sea, annexations, things we didn't think we would see again. Um, the liberal international order has been very good to Ireland, it's been very good to small countries. We have more countries now in the world than we've ever had before. That's not really an accident. It's because sort of the system we've had. As that system is, it seems to be fraying, um, how do you, what do you think small countries can do what do you think Ireland's role is with small countries globally in trying to sort of speak up for that liberal international order, a multilateral order, whatever we will call it, against these sort of more geopolitical forces, these giants clashing, you know, China, Russia, the U.S. and, and, and others? Yeah, well, I, I think, I think that, that is probably, probably the, the way the world is going to develop over the next number of decades, you know, major major economic and political blocs. You know, the United States, China, Europe, potentially India, in, India potentially, 
um, South American Mercosur if, if, if they come together in a way they haven't as yet, but, but, st but still might. So you're going to have these very power powerful blocks uh, in, in the world, and that makes it more multipolar uh, and less the kind of dominance of America that we had uh, uh, since, since the fall of the Berlin Wall. Um, and there'll be pluses and minuses to that. Uh, I, th I think for Ireland, part of our role uh, is, 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 is to be there in the European Union uh, and to make sure that European values and European principles um, remain strong in the world. Uh, and that's something you know we, we are concerned about. We would have almost assumed 10 or 20 years ago that the march of democracy and the march of free enterprise was unstoppable. And yet we've seen places like Turkey, places like Russia, start to go in the other direction. Uh, and that's why I think Europe needs to be strong. Um, and I think also, it's also why you need to have a strong Atlantic relationship. In terms of our individual role as a small country, uh, I think it's uh, through engagement in the UN, through engagement in multilateral organizations. Uh, and that's how we can make a difference. And if you go back to, I think it was Kennedy's speech in the Dáil when, when I was in, I had the opportunity to visit um, um, Didi Plaza and, and the Book Depository um, in Dallas the other day. Uh, it had me thinking about Kennedy, and one of the best speeches he ever made was the speech he made uh, in, in our parliament when he visited Ireland in 63, about six months before, uh, before he was killed. And he spoke about one of the strongest things that small countries can do is to, is to use their voice. And maybe that sounds a bit wishy-washy, but I think it's actually not. Um, small countries can show leadership in using their voice, but it has to be backed up by real engagement in, in international institutions, by things like a strong international development program, uh, by being willing to take part in peacekeeping operations, the kind of things that we do, but we can do uh, more of, I think, in the decades to come. Great. Well, thank you very much, and we'll, we'll open it up to, uh, to some questions for the audience. So um, I'll call on you. The microphone will come. Please make sure it's a question with a question mark at the end, and please make sure it's about foreign policy as well, um, rather than uh, domestic politics, since this is a foreign policy speech. So. Um, let's see, I've got the, the gentleman here in the, uh, yes, just, yes, you, uh, sorry, the person in front and then, well, we'll take maybe the two together, both of you ask a question, <laughs> compromise. Well, I was very pleased to hear you mention the possibility of a Marshall Plan for Africa, and uh, Ireland is no stranger to famine, um, it's certainly probably the reason I'm here in the United States is because of the famine. But um, uh, the, the question, I guess, is um, with the Paris Accords and the U.S. pulling out of that, the possibility of famine is even greater in Africa. And I wonder if you could talk about how the EU might be approaching food insecurity and famine in Africa. Thanks. And let's take the gentleman in front of you as well, and we'll take both together. Yeah. And maybe just state your name as well. I should have said that, and then the question. Hi, Taoiseach. Uh, Liam, I'm from Clare. Um, so, fantastic to hear you speak. And just piggybacking off Tom's last question uh, about the liberal international order and its frame. Uh, Could you hold the, the microphone Europe a little further up? up sorry. Yeah. Um, you've, you've seen the, uh, the European Union recently uh, seek to deeply integrate in terms of defense. Uh, I was wondering um, what role will the EU play in future? And more specifically, what role will Ireland play in terms of defence, especially in light of our recent commitment to PESCO? So that's a question on Af for those who didn't hear. A question on Africa, and then one on European defence cooperation and PESCO. Uh, I suppose t taking taking um, taking Africa first. Uh, we we often have this conversation um, around the European Council table. It's, couple of times a year, as you know, that the, the heads of state and government from across the EU meet together. We'll meet again at the end of March. Um, and almost always a major topic of discussion is, um, uh, is migration and the migration crisis. You know, what, what Brexit is to Ireland, the biggest issue for us in foreign policy, migration is the biggest issue for Italy and for most of the countries in Central and Eastern Europe because of what they've experienced in the last uh, couple of years. Um, and we always divide into the two sets of things that we can do. One is the internal action. What can we do to uh, share out migrants? What can we do to protect borders? And then external action. What can we actually do uh, to stem the flow of migrants to eliminate some of the push factors, uh, the reasons why people are migrating in the first place? Um, and I'm always trying to make the point very strongly that the most effective action, uh, you have to do both, obviously, but the most effective action is to try to stem 
the tide of migration to remove those economic and political push factors that cause people to want to risk their lives and walk hundreds of miles uh, across Europe to take the boats to get across the Mediterranean Sea in order to um, get, get out of the countries they come from and come to Europe. Um, and if you think about what's happened in the past couple of years, two relatively small countries collapsed, uh, failed politically, one being Libya with a population of four or five million, uh, one being Syria, don't know what the population of Syria is, maybe 10, 20 million. Uh, and look at the enormous um, migration crisis and humanitarian crisis that, uh, that has been caused by two relatively small countries imploding. Uh, imagine what would happen if Egypt or Algeria or Nigeria um, had a similar experience, hundreds of millions of people uh, on the move. Uh, and therefore, it has to be in our interests um, in all sorts of ways to make sure that we support these countries, um, support them economically, uh, support their institutions, help them to build capacity, um, help them to become successful countries in a way that some of them are not at the moment. Uh, and that's very much where the whole idea of having a Marshall Plan for Africa comes from, uh, because that was the original philosophy behind, behind the Marshall Plan back then, was to make sure that these countries in Europe didn't turn to communism, didn't, didn't collapse. And I think that's as true today as it was, um, as it was then. Uh, on on defence, um, you know, Ireland is, is in a usual position, as you, uh, as you know, from most of the European countries, in that we have a, uh, a long-standing policy of neutrality. And that means that we don't join military alliances, so we're not members of NATO. And it means that we can only take part in military operations uh, if they're mandated by the United Nations and with the support <laughs> of our government and parliament. Uh, and we're not going to depart from that. Uh, so that doesn't allow us to uh, participate as deeply in the European defence as other countries might. Um, but we have joined PESCO. We are founder members of that new uh, security cooperation. But rather than uh, getting involved in the more military aspects of that, what we're going to stick to is things like peacekeeping, uh, things like um, cybersecurity, um, things like technological developments. We're going to opt into certain programs that actually make sense for us to opt into, that preserve our neutrality, but actually do bring about added value. Like Ireland is never going to be a country that has a big air force. Um, we're not going to start buying aircraft carriers. It doesn't make, it doesn't make sense for us to do it. Uh, so our contribution to EU, EU security is never really going to be about firepower um, or, 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 or a military one. It's going to be around peacekeeping, around training, around security, around cybersecurity, uh, counterterrorism. And I think that's where we can play an added value role in a way we couldn't um, uh, uh, by, 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 by using uh, you know, force of conventional arms. Um, but I do think uh, one thing Europe as a whole, this isn't Ireland, but Europe as a whole, uh, so it does need to do, and this is one of the areas where I tend to agree with President Trump, uh, is it does need to start paying for its own defence uh, and start um, um, doing more to look after its own security. Uh, and really, the United Kingdom is one of the few countries that, that does that, um, to a lesser extent France. Uh, and it is 70 years now since the end of the Second World War. Uh, and we are, as a continent, still overly dependent on the United States for our defence and security, uh, and we shouldn't, we shouldn't, we shouldn't be like that. Uh, and I think Europe does need. Uh, we still want America in Europe, of course, for all sorts of reasons. It makes sense that we have America in Europe, uh, but we do, as a continent, need to um, rely less on the United States uh, to provide for our own security. Thank you. I'll take uh, two more, and I think uh, two, two people here at the front, Isabel Murray, there in the second row, and then the gentleman beside her. Yeah. Uh, welcome to Washington, Taoiseach, and thanks to Brookings and Tom for this excellent discussion. My name is Isabel Murray, and I'm chairman of the Irish Network in Washington, D.C. Uh, you've established we won't be getting a, a huge increase in the Air Force, but you do have a very uh, effective diplomatic force. Uh, ably uh, represented here by Ambassador Mulhall and his, um, his staff here in Washington. He has no counterpart in Dublin at the moment, and there has been no counterpart for the last 14 months. And uh, Ireland is not unusual in that regard. Many of those postings are open, and uh, many of us wouldn't fancy our chances of second in command in some of those postings given today's events. Um, I wonder if this is something you'll be raising when you visit the White House, uh, not just for Ireland, but for other countries also, 
uh, you know, you spoke of having a voice and how important it is. There has to be somebody to listen also. Thank you. And the, if, if you want to dodge that question, you have a, a second question here that you can pretend is more important. I'm <laughs> just kidding. Uh, I'm the Deputy Ambassador of Slovenia. Komank is my name. Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister, for your presentation. Uh, I think the TTIP was mentioned here today. Transatlantic Trade Investment Partnership, which was launched uh, back in 2012, I think, with a big hope and big, uh, uh, a big hope for the both sides, how it would improve the relations in trade. So, uh, unfortunately, it has been uh, cut off after many rounds of negotiations uh, in, uh, in the summer of 2016. And then put on ice uh, end of August 2016 when uh, the, the then uh, Minister of Economy of uh, one big member state proclaimed it dead. So uh, now we know that President Trump has excluded uh, the two NAFTA members, uh, Canada and uh, Mexico, from the tariffs. So do you think that uh, the TTIP could be revived or restarted in any way and that it would help resolve this issue and uh, prevent a possible trade war between the two partners. Thank you. Great. Okay, let's take those two. And I don't know if we might have time for one more round after that, but let's see how we go. Uh, yeah, on, on, on the first question, I, I, should, I should acknowledge that we have a, you know, we have a, a charge of an acting, an acting ambassador in, 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 uh, in Reece Smith in, in Dublin who's actually doing a very good job and I'm in contact with them regularly. Um, uh, so even though there isn't an ambassador, there is an acting ambassador. Having said that, we would, we would like to see an appointment. And I'm sure that's something that will be discussed uh, on Thursday in, in the Oval Office. Um, on the second question, on, on, on TTIP, you know, I, I, I'd be totally up for it. Uh, and so would, so would um, um, the Irish government. But we'd love to restart uh, and re-engage with TTIP. Um, but I'm also realistic about it. Uh, you know, we do have an administration uh, here in the United States, that is is moving away from free trade deals, is renegotiating NAFTA. I would be skeptical about the prospects of TTIP being the means by which we can avoid um, a, avoid a, a trade war, um, and it may be through the WTO that we avoid it rather than rather than through uh, to, to, through TTIP. Um, and for Europe, we need to focus on uh, trade agreements that have a realistic prospect of actually getting done. And you know we've done Canada already with CETA. Um, we have the agreement with Japan. Um, there are quite advanced negotiations on on Mercosur, and we really want to get started on Australia and New Zealand. So and Britain, um, and Britain as well, of course. Yeah. So um, that one, yeah, <laughs> that, one. <laughs> that one too. So um, you, you know, I, I guess what while while the United States is, is perhaps moving away from free trade agreements, the European Union is busy making them. Um, making a lot of deals, and uh, and uh, that's uh, that's that's going to continue. Okay, do we, we have time for one more quick round? I'm looking for a signal if we're, if we're okay. So Doug Radiker and then the lady here in the middle. So Doug at the frontier, and then I keep Hi, it brief. I, and we'll, we'll, sure. yeah. Doug Radiker from Brookings. Um, Ireland's the great success story in a post-euro crisis model. The economy is growing you know, incredibly well. Um, but some of that is allegedly on the back of some tax competitiveness. And last week, the commission actually cited Ireland as one of the countries that was not exactly on its pleasant list in terms of tax policies. And I know that Ireland has pushed back on that. Um, as Germany and France are pushing for harmonized European tax policies, how central do you think tax is going to be as the EU rolls out its economic policies across the Eurozone, and what would that mean for Ireland? Great. We have time for one more question, lady in the middle on the aisle. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Mindy Reiser. I'm vice president of an NGO called Global Peace Services USA. My question is about the robust Irish aid program <clears throat> and how some of those ideas that you're trying to implement in other parts of the world go back to Ireland specifically with regard to work, employment, and training. This is a challenge in the United States that uh, has not been completely addressed or addressed very well. So how are you handling those people left behind in economic development in your own country and in suggestions for working in other parts of the world? This is a critical question for the 21st century. 
Thank you very much. So Irish aid and uh, the very softball question from Doug on, on, on Ireland and tax. Yeah, on, yeah. on, on tax. Well, the last well, ones yeah, are always yeah. the toughest. Yeah. Well, the, you know, we, we, we've, we've very very clear and very straightforward position on, on tax, which we've articulated many times. And it's first of all that we believe in, in tax sovereignty. Uh, fundamentally, it's our view that um, member states should uh, set their own taxes, that uh, national parliaments set taxes at a national level, and uh, that's what funds national budgets, and um, we're not, um, not up for a departure from that. Um, in terms of our corporation profit tax, what we have is a 12.5% rate, a low flat rate corporation profit tax. We've had it for, for decades now, uh, and um, it's one that has crossed party support. All four major parties uh, support that policy. Uh, so even as a change of government in Ireland, um, investors have an assurance that our tax policy will remain the same, which wouldn't necessarily be the case in other countries. You know, uh, uh, Prime Minister Corbyn or President Sanders might take a different view on tax to, to the current uh, incumbents were, were, that ever to, um, were, were that ever to transpire. So it's as much about tax certainty as anything else. Um, to the extent to which there are companies avoiding their, their taxes, uh, that's not something um, that I favour. Uh, I don't want to be uh, a Prime Minister who has, heads a government that facilitates companies to avoid paying their taxes. Big companies should pay their taxes, should pay them in full, and should pay them where they're due. And we've worked very hard with the OECD in recent years to eliminate uh, loopholes like the double Irish, like stateless corporations, uh, that companies um, companies use to avoid paying their, their fair share of tax. Uh, but they find new ones very quickly, and they also find them in other countries, um, other, other than ours. But we're absolutely committed to working through the OECD on an international basis um, to uh, close any of those loopholes that exist and make sure that uh, companies um, do pay their taxes somewhere. Like we can't have a situation whereby uh, big companies think that they can not pay it anywhere. Um, whatever about paying our low rate, not paying it anywhere at all is something that we, um, uh, we can't stand over and we, um, and we, won't, um, uh, we won't, won't, be, um, won't, won't be part of. Uh, but in terms of our own economic policy though, uh, you know, it, it's, it's never been all about tax. Um, Ireland offers more than tax advantages. We have a really good talent pool of people who work in industries. If I go into Google or Facebook in Dublin, I see people from uh, 30, 40 different uh, na nationalities, different countries working there, um, You know, have a good education system, uh, have a good infrastructure that we're really going to invest in in the next 10 years. Um, uh, so uh, a, an economic policy, an industrial policy that's only based on no taxes wouldn't be a good one for us anyway. Uh, and more and more we'll focus on other things uh, like attracting talent as well as investment and, uh, and infrastructure and education because you have to have the whole package, I think. Um, not, not, sure, not sure I fully followed the last question, sorry. Uh, you mean in terms of economic, yeah. economic exclusion? And how does that factor back home in what you're trying to do for the people who've left been, been left behind in some of these areas? Yeah, like it's. A, I think it's a problem, and it's definitely a problem for us. And I'm sure it's a problem in uh, in all countries. We have, uh, we now have a very very low unemployment rate in Ireland. It's um, it's about six percent, three percent in terms of long term unemployment. But there are still lots of people who are uh, excluded from the economy for lots of different reasons. Uh, and what we try to do there mainly is is uh, changes to our welfare system. Um, whereas in the past our welfare system was quite passive, uh, people could receive uh, benefits, you know, uh, almost for life with little engagement from the public authorities, uh, and we now do a lot more to uh, encourage people to uh, become part of the labour force. Now there's an element of carrot and stick to it, there are disincentives if you don't cooperate, um, but if you do, uh, there's the availability of things um, like, like, like free education and training. Um, like supports for families in particular. Um, a lot of uh, lone parents were excluded from, or single parents were excluded, from, one parent families rather were excluded from the labor market because of the high cost of childcare, for example. And we've brought in free preschool, subsidized childcare, target subsidies for low-income families. Uh, and it's all of those different things uh, that I, th I think can make a difference. To the extent to which they apply internationally though, I, I don't know because obviously it's different from country to country. <coughs> Tisek, thank you very much uh, for a wonderful conversation, for your speech, uh, and very best of luck. Uh, 
the rest of this week with all your engagements. I know you're headed to New York as well. So please join me in thanking on Tisha Cleo Bracket. <laughs>